Right, this is uh, the New Zealand section uh, of the symposium, if you like. And first up is Simon Thornley. Uh, he is an epidemiologist uh, at the University of Auckland, a senior lecturer. Uh, his research interests include epidemiological methods uh, and the link between scabies and important diseases of childhood, such as acute rheumatic fever. Uh, many of you will know that Simon Thornley is uh, the founding member of the COVID Plan B group uh, after um, one of his, um, his his first piece, which I think uh, was the first person to suggest that the approach New Zealand was taking was uh, not necessarily entirely the right one. Um, Simon has been leading light for the group and continued with his research over this period. So Simon, are you with us for this presentation? Yeah, uh, okay. can you hear me, Mark? Yes, we can. We can see your presentation on screen as well. Oh, great. Okay. Well, Absolutely. thanks everyone for coming along and thanks, Mark and Verity, for putting this together. And uh, it's very humbling to have the international speakers uh, here and, and many of them have had ideas that have influenced my thinking uh, during this um, episode. So. I'll try and give you my take on it from an epidemiologist's perspective. Um, considering what's the magnitude of the threat, <clears throat> evidence for hard lockdowns, and what about the next step? We'll also touch on some of the modeling. So I think we've all seen the pictures of mass graves, intensive care units full, uh, new hospitals in Wuhan, um, a potential source in the wet market. So digging into the science, what do we know? Well, a new coronavirus was discovered. That means that it was not necessarily new, but uh, that it had first been discovered. So that's uh, a novel coronavirus. And coronaviruses are not something that we know a lot about in medicine. And so I had to do a bit of study um, about this. SARS and MERS, uh, the headline grabbing ones, but the ones that don't tend to grab the headlines are influenza-like the ones that cause influenza-like illnesses or the common cold, like HKU1. Uh, there was a case series from Wuhan initially with uh, respiratory illness, a characteristic pattern in the radiology, and a high mortality. And as uh, Dr. Katz pointed out, particularly in people with chronic disease, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, what he referred to as metabolic disease. And there was also the question about whether this was a zoonotic disease, so uh, that the virus is similar to one found in, in bats and that it may have been passed on through pangolins to humans. What were my initial thoughts? Well, I'd lived through the swine flu epidemic in 2009, and I've been part of the public health response at various times. And there was a real clamor about a high mortality initially from hospitalized cases and public health units all trying to stamp it out. We're dishing out a lot of Tamiflu. And then once needles were put into arms, we showed that in New Zealand that the, the, uh, the infection had, was almost ubiquitous. One in three of us had positive antibodies to H1N1 swine flu. And so things calmed down a little bit after that. What are some other things that we know about the seasonal, the seasonal coronaviruses that cause influenza-like illnesses. They are nasty when they get into rest homes and they can uh, cause a high rate of fatality in rest homes, not unlike what we've observed in this coronavirus. So <clears throat> my thoughts initially was how serious is the virus and we really need to look at the infection fatality rate. And 
Uh, the initial testing was confined to the symptomatic, so there was a perception that it was extremely deadly. Uh, three in a hundred were reported to die from the infection, which makes it a lot more than the seasonal influenza, which is about one to five in a thousand die. And we've also seen evidence of excess mortality, and that was the question I asked for Jay. Was that in, in Europe, for example, we've certainly seen uh, high mortality in the older age groups, and that's uh, been driving this spike of increased mortality in Europe. So with the infection fatality rate, the story goes that initially there's the numerator consists of the deaths and the denominator is the positive cases from the genetic test or the PCR test done in hospital. And then South Korea started looking at the community with PCR as did Iceland and found that there were many more, many of them asymptomatic. And then serology started to get online with a few false starts and some inaccurate tests. And then we found also that T cells, there was a specific T cell response. And so this denominator has gone wider and larger, which has brought the infection fatality rate right down. So just digging a bit deeper into the numerator, the deaths from COVID, we see that uh, there's been pretty clear that there's been an exaggeration of the deaths. There wasn't a good definition of death from COVID early on. And in fact, in an Italian review, uh, only 12% of the initial fatalities were actually due to um, the virus uh, in, a, in a government review. And we've also seen the mean age of the case is about 80 years, which happens to be our life expectancy. And um, Spanish flu is the mean age of death, which has sparked some of the concern around COVID. Uh, the mean age of death was about 26. Uh, and the denominator, so we've talked about the denominator and how that's progressively enlarged as serology has come on board. And so Jay talked about uh, the dialing back of the infection fatality rate to a median of 0 0.26 with a range between 0 0.02 and 0 0.86. And as we discussed earlier, with the peak in fatality, it's likely that it's a little bit more than the, the range of seasonal flu, but not much more. Here I compared uh, the age of deaths of COVID cases from the government website with uh, 2019 um, distribution of deaths also from a government website uh, during the same period the year before. And we see that the nature of these distributions is very similar, suggesting that survival with or without the virus is uh, not dramatically changed. We know that rest homes are particularly vulnerable uh, in almost all countries, a lion's share of the deaths have occurred in rest homes, and it's been between 20 and 60 percent. So that's where our priority was as a Plan B group, was to protect both hospitals and rest homes and the capacity in public health. So let's just think about the infection fatality rate in New Zealand. We had 22 deaths. This maybe needs to be updated now, but about 1,500 cases, uh, fatality of 1.4%. We've seen that overseas, where serology has been done, uh, that increases the number of cases, as Jay talked about, by a factor of about 50-fold. So that we get an infection fatality rate much, much lower.
Um, and that questions why we are taking such drastic measures. Obviously, that has to be tempered with other information that we've seen of mortality spikes. However, I think that is uh, largely related to nosocomial transmission in hospitals um, and in rest homes. And there's certainly been um, public discussion of some mistakes that were made in terms of sending convalescing patients into rest homes where there's been large outbreaks of the virus. Um, David Spiegelhalter, a hero of mine in the statistical world, uh, probably one of the world, world's best known statisticians, compared the age-related fatality rate for British men and women with the fatality rate, which are the dots here, for COVID cases and found that they're about the same. And his quote was, having COVID is like squeezing a year's worth of risk into a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks that you have the disease. And so there, that explains the peak that you can have in the overall uh, mortality, whereas actually the area under curve for mortality, we'll only know this, and once the epidemics die down, may not be uh, substantially different from previous years. Um, in terms of case series, uh, we've found a high proportion of cases have metabolic disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. Um, and certainly previous work to this has been looking at sugar and refined starch as important causes of these uh, diseases. And so one thing I got from this morning's session was Dr. Katz talking about optimizing and assessing our risk. And I think that's an important point. What about the lockdown? That was one of the most uh, dramatic public health interventions I've seen. I question where did the evidence come from? It came from China. Uh, in Wuhan, there was an early lockdown and then there was a later harsh lockdown. And there's some evidence, I suppose, that uh, there was some benefit, although it's very hard to tell in these time series analyses. What I saw early on was a paper by Wilfred Riley, a political uh, professor in uh, Kentucky, and he compared states that had lockdown with states that hadn't and found no difference. I uh, built an app looking at his data and also at uh, country data. And I'll just see if I can share that. May just take a little bit of time to see. But if you compare stringency of lockdown for each country, so here we have lockdown, oh sorry, stringency. So these are higher lockdown over here, uh, lower lockdown over here. And we look at the cumulative cases in terms of deaths, so we could look at cases. And we see on average, those who lock down like Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Brazil, and Europe. Uh, we've got Italy here. They had higher rates on average of cases than those that locked down to a lower extent. Here's Sweden down here, um, one of the less uh, restrictive countries. So certainly not strong statistical evidence of benefits of lockdown. And actually I've uh, taken account of a whole bunch of other factors like testing, GDP, age, hospital beds, diabetes, and even after doing that, you don't see great benefit. Um, let's just get back to lockdown. Uh, so, what we've seen also overseas is increasing evidence of immunity. Um, so high levels in Northern France, lower levels in parts of the US, but certainly much higher denominator and spread of the virus than we've 
assumed. So putting COVID in perspective, uh, John Ioannidis, uh, he's been referred to Stanford Professor of Epidemiology, who I have a lot of respect for, said that the risk of COVID, even in heavily hit countries, is about the same risk of driving a car 15 to 100 kilometers a day during the pandemic. Uh, that's for people aged under 65. And so if young people or working age people and children are at so low risk, one has to question why are we shutting down workplaces, shutting down schools, why are we not protecting the elderly? There's a few downsides that we've observed in New Zealand from the lockdown. For example, a spike in rheumatic fever cases in Wellington. This leads young Māori and Pacific children to die early. Uh, also, uh, many more people going on the benefit uh, since the lockdown. Another 50,000 almost people uh, getting out of work. Uh, billions spent, uh, national debt escalating, about $2,000 per capita in New Zealand uh, spent on the subsidy so far. And concern about uh, particular areas that are dependent on tourism and our national debt, which uh, we've only recently recovered from. We know there's a strong association between suicide and unemployment and uh, although we've been reassured that there's been no excess suicides, the government actually hasn't released the data on this from what I've seen. Seen internal documents from the government uh, showing that a cost benefit analysis is about 96 to one in terms of costs compared to benefits, and that's putting va dollar values on, on lives. Um, and so the government advisors were actually saying that the response was disproportionate. Modeling has been a feature and uh, Sinetra has given us a crash course in epidemic modeling, so I won't go through it. But basically it involves people moving from the susceptible to the infected and the recovered. And there's an assumption that everyone's susceptible and that the infection fatality is high and we extrapolated data from overseas and we got very large estimates, 80,000 80, deaths in this headline. People must be wondering how are these so inaccurate? And uh, sorry, um, just going back, looking at modeling the New Zealand outbreak question on my mind was how effective was it and how many lives did it save? I want to get this work published, but here's an early view. Lockdown was instituted here. We expect after a week or so the effect of the lockdown and we allow the curve to diverge and it does from the expected, but it's rather subtle. If you total up the expected number of cases compared to the observed with and without lockdown, you get about 100 cases difference, which translates to about one death. Uh, others have looked at Europe, and we expect this uh, slow decline in the growth rate. That's something that happens during an epidemic and is responsible for the characteristic up and down curve. We actually seen a delay in that the slowing of the growth rate in lockdown countries. Um, it wasn't so marked in Great Britain, but certainly marked in Italy, uh, France, and Spain. So why did the models get it wrong? Um, well, I think there was an assumption that there's a totally new disease, a totally susceptible population. Um, and uh, it's become clear that there's some cross immunity from other coronaviruses to SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so the modeling really, it looks very sophisticated, but all it gives you is this characteristic curve. And as others have said, 
even the modeling itself doesn't justify reducing numbers or eradication because the area under the curve is the same in each scenario. Um, so this is comparing the model with the observed reality and um, having some experience doing these models and trying to forecast epidemics, I know that they, it is very easy to get it wrong with models um, compared to modeling uh, to analyzing observed data. So we assume that the New Zealand population was entirely susceptible. Uh, there's likely background immunity of between 40 to 60% due to other coronaviruses. And there's the um, reference to that. What about elimination? Uh, if you're going to pick a virus to eliminate from New Zealand, I wouldn't be picking a coronavirus. Um, many coronaviruses are endemic, for example, HKU1. Uh, there's many asymptomatic cases, very difficult to contact trace. Sensitivity of the PCR test is not ideal. Clinical syndrome is not uh, is indistinguishable from some other respiratory viruses. And uh, we may get very low cases because we're developing immunity. It would be nice if we had some information in that area. There's been some early promise though, it's uh, undeniable there's been three months without a case, but I think it's too early to celebrate success since the usual WHO criteria for elimination is interrupted transmission for more than 36 months, high quality surveillance and confirmation with genotyping. And what's been concerning to me is the changing government goalposts on lockdown. So it went from protecting ICUs and hospitals and public health, the flattening the curve idea to a go hard and go early, and then elimination to vaccination, which Byram's covered the vaccinations looking like a very remote possibility. And now we've got four cases and I am now currently in level three in Auckland. So what, just wrapping up here, what do I think we should be doing? Well, I think there's a few lessons I've learned over this, favor collected data over models, uh, vaccines a long way off, and as Byram's talk about, talked about, people who are going to benefit most are going to be least uh, have less of a response from the vaccine. I think we need to get back to work in schools. We've lost a lot of jobs. Uh, a lot of people are hurting financially. We need to. What do we need to do? We need to do good infection control in rest homes and hospitals. And I think that's one thing New Zealand has done well in terms of segregating uh, COVID positive patients from other patients and protecting um, uh, vulnerable people. I think elimination is unrealistic. Shutting the borders in society, is it really worth it? I don't think it's justified given the infection fatality rate that we've been seeing. And as Jay pointed out, zero survey and understanding our immunity to the virus is, is I think, very important for driving policy decisions. So thank you very much. It's been humbling to see how many people have tuned in and um, uh, happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you, Simon. So, uh, yes, we do have uh, a range of questions. I just want to assure everybody that um, we're watching the questions uh, and trying to uh, meld them together, the ones along certain themes when we're putting them to the presenters. Um, Sorry, I've gone over time a bit. That, yeah, that's, yeah, Simon, that's okay. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes to put some questions to you, though. Um, one of them is... Uh, this, this problem around modeling, uh, I mean, at the start of every one of the, uh, these epidemics or pandemics, we, we don't know things. So we do need models, don't we, to make decisions. Uh, how can we get the models better for next time? Yeah, I, uh, that's true, Mark. Um, you know, I've been involved in measles outbreaks and people have asked me for models um, and I've I've made models to predict what's going on. 
One thing that I haven't seen in this outbreak, which I think is concerning, is that there's been very little updating of the models with observed data. And that was crucial for me to get things anywhere near right with measles and mumps. Uh, yeah. Um, I think just a, a level of skepticism on the behalf, on, on the terms of decision makers with models that uh, these, you know, there's a whole lot of assumptions and it's easy to get things wrong and putting too much confidence in them is a mistake in my opinion. Um, so is it typical to be, uh, to, to know so little about uh, a virus um, as it, of, you know, the previous coronaviruses, have we, have we known little about them when they've started as well? Is it, is it, is it typical for um, the, the medical fraternity, public health fraternity to know so little? Well, I think coronaviruses have been really small type. I mean, obviously, there's been the public health headline grabbing ones, SARS and MERS, but uh, generally, um, you know, we, we've just labelled uh, a lot of this as influenza-like illness, which I think gives you an indication that it's an area that hasn't been studied in, in detail. And so it's been interesting to see that these papers that crop up with uh, coronaviruses wreaking havoc in rest homes um, that really haven't been a, a major um, consideration in uh, public health or medical decision making. Um, so you mentioned swine flu and that uh, the, when that had occurred here in New Zealand, People, you were ready to take, you and, and your colleagues were ready to take some action, uh, but noticed that it was what, uh, th uh, one in three people were infected. And so you, that you'd sort of escaped the window for, of opportunity as it were, it was out there. Um, uh, so the, the public health uh, advisors changed their minds on the data. Why do you think that hasn't happened this time? That's a good question, Mark. Uh, I was really hoping to see a zero survey early on, which I think was important in terms of understanding uh, how protected or not our, uh, the public are, what the exposure of the virus has been. Uh, yeah. Seems to me that there's no uh, good reason not to do a zero survey. I mean, zero surveys have, in some parts of the world have produced uh, disappointing results and uh, the prevalence of serology has been lower than expected, but uh, T cell responses to the virus seem to be more important than, for example, uh, H1N1. So, yeah, that whole area of population immunity, which from a disease modeling point of view and, and projecting risks and making policy seems so important is, is really a black hole in New Zealand. And I can't really understand why that the uh, Ministry of Health is so lax on this, given um, the, the swine flu story. A question about uh, your, your study into, lo into lockdown or the effects thereof. Um, I mean, lockdowns are uh, a regulated thing that the governments have decided to try to do. But, you know, you will remember just before lockdown here and a couple of days leading up to it, um, that people were already responding themselves. You know, people were not going into work. Uh, we didn't see masks at that time. But people had already decided to, to slow down um, their public appearances to go out into public. People were weary, so yeah. Can, can you? You can, that's going to happen anyway. So you can't kind of measure an, uh, the accuracy of a lockdown uh, just by the government regulated period. There's there's going to be a natural tendency of people to uh, to be careful, careful and weary anyway. Yeah, well, it's not. Uh, sorry, it's uh, that that particular analysis is just looking at the move from level two to level four. So all the social distancing. Uh, everything that was happening before that is is really not uh, part of modeling that effect. It's, right. it's really look, looking at that specific date of moving from level two to level four. Um, did that do anything extra? Because it certainly had 
profound consequences for uh, our lives. Mm. Yeah, I think the point of it is, though, that some people are saying, well, uh, you know, people are going to be weary anyway. So the economic impact, you can't uh, sheet home directly just to uh, regulated lockdown, but to people's weariness and uh, in response to what was being presented as a pandemic. Um, uh, another thought uh, question here is about um, if, whether or not you could explain um, the Swedish model versus the other Nordic models. Swedish model is back in that, is back in um, uh, contention again. Let's say, um, in fact, um, the WHO themselves, uh, special envoy uh, on co Corona um, virus, had said a few days ago that the Swedish model had a lot to commend it. Um, so I wonder if you were able to explain the, the difference between that model and, say, the other Nordic countries? Well, yeah, I, I think the Swedes decided that social distancing and flattening the curve was a good idea, but uh, they certainly didn't lock down and mm. they had this idea of um, writing it out with herd immunity, which is how we get over 99% of uh, viral pandemics. Uh, and so I think they learned some lessons about protecting the elderly um, and uh, particularly the rest homes, which I think we can learn from. Um, but I think you know, from my point of view, it's, it's a sensible model. And certainly that idea of uh, monitoring uh, our hospitals and uh, public health capability and getting on with life as much as possible, I think, uh, and protecting the frail and elderly, obviously. Um, but for the rest of us who are very low risk, uh, getting on with life, uh, I, I think it's sensible. Um, one other question, I think one time that's just popped up. Um, is the pandemic over? Through, through, if you look at the rest of the world and the numbers, the, the results, would you say it's over? Well, that's a good question because uh, we, you, that characteristic curve that you see from a viral epidemic that can only really happen if uh, the vi transmission of the virus is either interrupted or where the people, the virus is running out of susceptibles and uh, immunity is, is more important. And I think. Uh, overseas, where you've seen that the virus has uh, has been many, many, many cases that they're likely to have immunity, and that any second waves will be very small. Uh, it's still balancing, uh, trying to work out in New Zealand where we're at is hampered by a lack of data. We we still really don't know what our immune status is. My guess is that immunity is, is much higher than we expect, mm. but it'd be nice to see some data. Um, there's been a, quite a few comments about um, seroprevalence studies today uh, and on the questions as well. Um, but uh, there have been those sorts of surveys done in other parts of the world, including the countries that are still locking down or trying to in various ways. Those, um, the changing IFR doesn't seem influenced by the seroprevalence surveys, doesn't seem to have changed the nature of most of the Western countries' regulatory response. Would it would it do so here? Well, I think some Europe, for example, is opening its borders uh, and they're relatively relaxed about imported cases. Iceland is in the same boat. Uh, so I think they've. You can see that the government. Uh, has taken quite a different approach to the risk posed by the virus. And uh, I think perhaps that information has helped. I, 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 it's hard for me to get inside the head of the government to see how they're making these decisions. But right. um, yeah, I think we really haven't seen any indication that though from the government that those early infection fatality calculations uh, need to be updated and i think that's important all right thank you there are a bunch of other questions popping up on my screen um, that have come in as you've been talking
so you're sticking with us for a bit longer. Yeah, uh, well, if you could take a look and see if you could uh, answer some of those questions uh, directly uh, written to them. Um, so people keep on firing questions at the panel. Um, thank you, Simon, for that. We'll, we'll switch now to Grant Morris.